Durham police investigate after a dead body is found in Lake Scugog. Dan Kearns, The Standard. Scugog. A man was pronounced dead in Lake Scugog on Thursday, February 16th. That day, on Twitter, the Durham Regional Police announced they were conducting an investigation after locating a body in the water near Pier Street and Center Street in Scugog. An update tweet posted later confirmed a male had been pronounced deceased, but there is no foul play suspected at this time. In his own social media post, Scugog Fire Chief Mark Burney stated, Scugog's firefighters were called to the Caesarea Pier in the afternoon for an ice rescue. Lake Scugog ice is melting, fragile, and not safe. Please stay off the ice, the post added. Police have not released the age or name of the victim. Lessons from the Father of the Canadian Flag by Aaron O'Toole, MP, Durham Region At midday, on February 15, 1965, Canada's new flag was raised on Parliament Hill for the first time. Exactly two months earlier, in the wee hours of the morning, Parliament approved the iconic red and white maple leaf as our new flag. To mark this momentous occasion, the Member of Parliament who had been tasked with leading the process of creating the new flag wrote a quick note to the person who had proposed its design. The note from MP John Matheson was prescient. The flag had served our country well and will continue to be an enduring symbol of liberty, tolerance, and opportunity at home and around the world. The note was sent to the Dean of Arts at the Royal Military College of Canada, RMC, in Kingston, because the RMC flag served as the basis for our modern flag. Dr. George Stanley had stood with John Matheson on the parade square of the RMC, pointed to the flag atop the Mackenzie Building, a building named after Canada's second Prime Minister who founded the college, and said, There, John, is your flag. Stanley's submission took the red borders astride a white centre and simplified the design, down to a single red maple leaf, rather than a more complex three maple leaf sprig atop an armoured mailed fist on the RMC flag. While I would have loved the armoured fist to remain, in homage to the resolve Canadians have shown on the battlefield, it was understandable Stanley toned down the military aspects of the flag. After all, he was our first modern military historian, and was well known for his book Canada's Soldiers, the Military History of an Unmilitary People. The creation of this new symbol was very important in this period of our country's history. It was meant to show a modern and independent Canada on the world stage, as it approached its centennial celebrations in 1967. The idea a new symbol was needed formed part of Pearson's campaign promises from 1963 and had already sparked a raucous debate across the country. At one point, Prime Minister Pearson was loudly booed and heckled by veterans attending the annual convention of the Royal Canadian Legion when he spoke about it. This was going to be a difficult debate about history and identity in a country which always seemed to struggle with both. Prime Minister Pearson charged MP John Matheson with navigating the choppy waters to create a new Canadian flag for two key reasons. First, he was a congenial Liberal MP from Eastern Ontario who was well-liked on all sides of the House. He could bring some of the recalcitrant Tories on side, or perhaps at least get them to drop the opposition and embrace the new symbol after the vote. But perhaps more importantly, Matheson was chosen because he was a war veteran who bore the scars of service. He cut quite the figure on Parliament Hill, using a cane throughout his post-war life. At first glance, everyone knew John Matheson was a patriot. A patriot who was also a happy warrior in Parliament made for a very difficult opposition target. John solicited designs, managed the debate, and made a case for this bold move by the government. In the end, closure was needed to end the filibustering and bring the 163 to 78 vote recounted in the note to Stanley. Matheson had done his job, and our country should be forever grateful every February 15th. I had the great honor of meeting John Matheson several times when I was a cadet at the Royal Military College. The first time I met him was when he spoke at a convocation ceremony and received an honorary degree. The next time was when I volunteered to be his aide for a visit to the college. A third time was when he just showed up to watch an RMC hockey game. I climbed down from the stands and joined him to watch and chat by the glass. I treasure each of these encounters. He was one of the most inspiring and genuine people I have ever met. A veteran, a member of parliament, a judge, an early advocate for the disabled. He had done it all and did it with a smile and a positive approach. What I loved the most about our interactions was, he would ask me about my background, 
why I had joined the military, and what I thought about the issues of the day. He was a great Canadian and the father of our flag, yet he was interested in hearing about what this 20-year-old kid from Bowmanville thought about the country. His generous spirit was infectious, and his wisdom remains available to us today. John Matheson delivered one of the most eloquent, touching, and thoughtful speeches about our country I have ever heard. Nothing I have heard in a decade in the House of Commons has ever come close to the convocation speech Matheson delivered to the RMC class of 1993. By this point in his life, Matheson needed two canes to go from his wheelchair to the podium, but his smile and charm needed no assistance. On that day, he dedicated his speech to an RMC graduate who none of us had ever heard of. Captain Bob Donald had taken over forward observation officer duties for Matheson, after he had been injured the day before. That substitution happened to come as the Battle of Ortona intensified around Casa Berardi. Bob Donald and his Royal Canadian Artillery fought alongside Captain Paul Triquet and his Royal 22nd Regiment, in some of the most ferocious fightings of the Italian campaign. After the battle, Triquet was awarded the Victoria Cross for his gallant leadership, and Bob Donald was dead. Both were courageous Canadian soldiers, yet one had his life cut short when he replaced John Matheson. Fifty years later, Matheson used the platform of recognition he was receiving from the RMC to pay tribute to the memory of his friend. Bob never wore a medal, never had a wife or child, and I, honored today, have been blessed with a loving wife, six children, and sixteen precious grandchildren. What a husband, parent, citizen this Robert Alexander Donald of RMC would have made had he not perished. Matheson then recited a small poem which he had written in tribute to Donald. There was not a dry eye in that humid arena in Kingston thirty years ago. I get emotional just thinking about it today. One life was sacrificed so another could go on and live, love, and build a modern and successful Canada embodied by our flag. This was a powerful lesson for that graduating class of young officers in 1993, but his speech also has lessons for all Canadians today. Matheson knew some of the challenges our country faces from our differences could also be sources of some of our greatest strengths. His examples were profound. The story of English-Canadian Bob Donald fighting alongside French-Canadian Paul Triquet underscored this theme. French and English serving alongside one another while respecting their differences. He recounted how French-Canadian prisoners of war at Dieppe had refused chocolate from the Germans when English-Canadian prisoners were not offered it as well. He declared our bilingualism remains one of the boldest acts of creative statesmanship in Canadian history and has served as an example to many other nations. Matheson spoke about gender differences, diversity, and working together to serve the community and country in a manner which was astounding for a speech delivered 30 years ago by a Canadian who was already in his 80s. He believed the Canadian experience of inclusion and interdependence was the greatest of our strengths and an example to the world and the challenges it faced. This is just as true today as it was then. Think of your country as the laboratory for the emergence of a society of the future, where people of diverse origins develop the ultimate social art of interdependent living. Rubbing up against differences creates a kind of enriching, redemptive energy. John Matheson was ahead of his time. What he described as the redemptive energy of depending upon one another is something Canadians should reflect upon as we celebrate Flag Day in the aftermath of a pandemic and amid the challenges of war and uncertainty around the world. He was a veteran who helped give us freedom. He was an MP who helped give us our flag. He was a patriot who also challenged us to put service to Canada first. And in true happy warrior fashion, Matheson ended his speech that day this way. Be of good cheer and confident that right will finally prevail. Optimism is indeed a form of courage. Faith is greater than doubt and love stronger than hate. Thank you, John. Viva la Canada. Ross Memorial Hospital to continue to work to recover from a cybersecurity incident. Dan Kearns, The Standard. Kawartha Lakes. Following a cybersecurity event which occurred earlier this month, Ross Memorial Hospital, RMH, estimates it will be a number of weeks before operations return to normal. This finding was announced in a press release sent out on Friday, February 17th. On Tuesday, February 7th, the local hospital announced they had declared a code gray at 10.53 p.m. on Sunday, February 5th, due to a suspected cybersecurity incident. 
The most recent press release stated the hospital has been working diligently to bring all impacted systems back online. As of press time, the Code Gray remains in place at the local hospital, despite what hospital officials describe as significant progress since the Code Gray was announced. At this time, RMH can't provide a specific timeline as to when the Code Gray will be lifted. The hospital will continue to share updates as the restoration process continues and more information becomes available, the press release concluded. The hospital is continuing to encourage people with less urgent conditions to consider other care options as the hospital works to recover from this incident. Welcome to You've Got to Be Kidding, a podcast that offers a different perspective of life around us. Listen now to author Jonathan Van Bilsen. I've always had a dislike for telephone answering machine. Once you leave a message, it's there. You can't revise it, re-record it, or delete it. And quite often, I leave words which I really did not mean to say. I think most of us have been in situations where we've said something regrettably silly. But once it's been orated, all we can do is cringe at the memory. Fortunately, there are much worse comments made by much greater people, a few of which I've listed below. Film star Brooke Shields was selected spokesperson for the federal anti-smoking campaign. When interviewed, she responded with, Smoking kills. If you're killed, you've lost a very important part of your life. Well, Brooke, I suppose that is quite logical. Surprisingly to most of us, politicians do not always say the smartest things, as was recorded during an interview with Vice President Al Gore, who is all about the environment. Gore spoke at a university about climate concerns. It isn't pollution that's harming the environment, he said. It's the impurities in our air and water that are doing it. Well, Al, I'm really glad you cleared that up for us. Another vice president, Dan Quayle, was heard speaking about the perfection of living in California. I love California, he said. I practically grew up in Phoenix. Well, Dan, National Geographic must be having quite a fit. Our own Prime Minister, Jean Chrétien, discussing the standard of proof of the threat posed by Saddam Hussein in 2002, said, I don't know. A proof is a proof. What kind of a proof? It's a proof. A proof is a proof. And when you have a good proof, it's because it's proven. Well, Mr. Prime Minister, I guess that proves it. Keppel Enderbury, the former Attorney General for Australia, was caught on tape saying, Traditionally, most of Australia's imports come from overseas. Hmm. Well, now that's logical, but not as profound as a statement made by Mayor Marion Barry of Washington, D.C., who uttered the famous phrase, Outside of the killings, Washington has one of the lowest crime rates in the country. Wow, that makes you want to move there, doesn't it? Lastly, Joel Theismann, famous NFL football quarterback, said while he was an ESPN broadcaster, The word genius isn't applicable in football. A genius is a guy like Norman Einstein. Well, I'm really glad that football injuries have no effect on our bodies. I know these are mostly older people, but I'm certain young Canadians have their embarrassing moments as well. Was it not our dear Prime Minister who searched for the right words before speaking about wearing a mask during the pandemic and uttered the following? A mask protects others more than it protects you. It prevents you from breathing or speaking moistly on them. You can certainly tell from his face how he instantly regretted those words. I'm Jonathan Van Bilson, and this is You've Got to Be Kidding. TLDSB to conduct two boundary reviews. Dan Kearns, The Standard. Kawartha Lakes. The Trillium Lakelands District School Board is going to be looking at potential boundary changes for a couple of their school areas. At a committee of the whole meeting on Tuesday, February 14th, Trustees approved a recommendation to authorize their staff to complete boundary reviews for Parkview Public School in Lindsay, and for two schools in close proximity to each other, Dr. George Hall Public School and Mariposa Public School. In a report, Superintendent Tim Ellis explained the Parkview boundary review had been started because of new developments in the area. The city of Kawartha Lakes is experiencing considerable growth on the Highway 35 corridor between Colborne Street and Thunderbridge Road. With the proposed developments, which have received approval at the municipal level, it is expected there will be upwards of 2,000 units constructed in that area. Currently, these development areas fall within the Parkview Public School catchment area. This school is currently at capacity, and there are limited options to place additional portable classrooms on the site. 
capital requests to the Ministry for an addition would not be forthcoming until the Board utilizes its available capacity in Lindsay, the report read. Superintendent Ellis told trustees why the Board is looking at boundary changes for the other two schools. The boundary is best described as a donut, with the middle of the donut being Dr. George Hall and the outside of the donut being Mariposa. We just wanted to engage the community in discussions on whether it would make sense to continue to have boundaries like that, or if we need to investigate something along the lines of a north-south border. Following the review, the staff are expected to bring a report back to the board, with recommendations for trustees to consider at the June board meeting. Kawartha Lakes approves the 2023 capital budget. Dan Kearns, The Standard, Kawartha Lakes. City of Kawartha Lakes Council deliberated and approved the 2023 capital budget at a meeting on Tuesday, February 14th. The budget totals $57.7 million, including a $26.6 million investment in roads and bridges projects. I'm pleased our new council has passed its first capital budget, and it is within about 3% of the long-term financial plan, LTFP, forecasts. This is commendable given the current economic climate and given we are still recovering from the challenges of the pandemic. Council can assure residents we're looking after the municipality's assets while working towards ever improving the condition of our roads in a prudent fashion, read a statement from Mayor Doug Elmsley. During discussions, councillors added several projects to the budget, including purchasing a sandbagging machine at the cost of $40,000 and a $293,000 project to resurface Coldstream Road and Greywood Drive, and $100,000 for a servicing study and design for a splash pad in Omimi. We have got to be united as a city, and this is a great community project to get behind, Ward 1 Councillor Emma Eo said regarding the Omimi splash pad project. Mayor Elmsley agreed with Councillor Yeo. I think this would be a great project for Omimi. I think Omimi is a growing community, and it's something they need to complement their beach park, and I speak in favor of doing it. However, one project which did not receive approval for this year's budget was $75,000 for the creation of a pump park in Little Britain. A pump park is defined as a circuit of rollers, bank turns, and features designed to be ridden completely by riders pumping, generating momentum by up and down body movements instead of pedaling or pushing. Community Services Director Craig Shanks explained, Due to the city looking at placing a pump park in Pawneepool, this pump park project is not required. Ward 6 Councillor Ron Ashmore questioned if it was possible for the former Ops Arena to be saved rather than demolished. The cost to renovate and rehabilitate that facility is significant, Director Shanks responded. It is not usable. Various portions of the facility are not usable. And some we can't even enter. The potential is there, but it would be in a potential rebuild if the city chose to move in that direction. Deliberations on the remaining budgets, including the operating budget, special projects budget, and the water and wastewater budget, will be held on Tuesday, February 28th. You've Got to Be Kidding was presented by X4 Media, with permission from the Standard Media Group. We endeavor to make all information contained in this program as accurate as possible at production time. X4 Media and the Standard Media Group are not responsible for any liabilities resulting from information contained in this program. For more information, please visit x4media.ca. The Standard Podcast was produced by Greenstream Studio for The Standard Newspaper.